Thanks for taking a moment to watch this video. The title is intentionally worded to grab the attention of the drone community. I'm not going to reveal my answer to the question until the end. When you've watched the video, you can let me know your answer to the important question in the comments below. Let me make one thing clear straight away. I have no axe to grind with the men and women of NAV Canada who manage our national air traffic services. They play a critical role in ensuring that Canadian aviators and many others from around the world operate as safely as possible in our national airspace. You're possibly wondering what qualifies me to ask the question at all? Well, I have hundreds of hours of fixed wing experience in light aircraft and as a lifetime member of one of Canada's oldest flying schools, I delivered private pilot ground school instruction for many years. I also flew RC models in Europe for decades before coming to Canada in 2005. My drone experience goes back to 2013 when I owned and flew the first widely accessible small R pass, the Phantom 1. Today I fly a Mavic 3. Last year I logged more than 900 flights, many of them in controlled airspace. And this year's looking equally busy. So where's the beef? After all, the vast majority of drone pilots in Canada have little or no interaction with NAV Canada. The company's engagement really only relates to approval of flight in controlled airspace by advanced certificate holders. Let's not forget that the role of the company, set up in 1996 as a private non-governmental entity, as stated on its own website, is to deliver the air traffic services, provide the critical information, design and build the technology, and maintain the essential systems that help ensure the safe movement of aircraft. I've no doubt that considerable corporate knowledge and experience usually contribute to the company's operational decisions. But nothing could have prepared it for the rapid widespread growth of the drone community. When NAV Canada had to apply the regulations introduced by Transport Canada in 2019 to the integration of drones into the national airspace, they were clearly faced with a real challenge. It would have helped enormously if they had turned to members of the recreational drone community when they were wrestling with decisions about arrangements for managing drones. But instead, they fell back largely on experience with crewed aircraft. Their consultations were focused on the existing aviation community, which had little or no experience of drones and a media-biased predisposition to present them as a threat. No one flying drones resists the principle that crewed aircraft should take priority over drones. After all, the pre-existing rules for conflict avoidance were all predicated on the manoeuvrability of the aircraft type concerned, and drones are infinitely more manoeuvrable than any machine with human beings on board. There's no difficulty understanding and accepting this, but many of the arrangements for NAV Canada's management of drones are not quite as easy to swallow. NAV Canada applies two basic criteria to drone integration. These are separation by altitude and the maintenance by drone pilots of a visual line of sight to their aircraft at all times. Separation by altitude is a thoroughly familiar concept to aviators. It's applied already very successfully to the separation of IFR and VFR traffic and the allocation of distinct altitude levels to deconflict aircraft moving eastbound or westbound. Maintenance of line of sight is another echo of VFR flight rules which require that the ground must always be in sight. No concerns here until NAV Canada went way overboard. Bear in mind 
unless you're flying a drone weighing less than 250 grams, you must hold an advanced certificate to use controlled airspace. Advanced certification is far from straightforward. It involves passing a challenging examination covering a wide range of aviation topics, including human factors, meteorology, aerodynamics, aeronautical charts, and much more. And the pass mark is 80%. Certification requirements don't end there. You have to undergo an in-person flight review to demonstrate, amongst other things, that you understand and can apply emergency procedures effectively, and that you have full control of your drone at all times. Given this stringent standard for advanced operation, why is it that NAV Canada then imposes requirements on advanced drone pilots that appear to ignore the knowledge and skills implicit in earning the qualification? Putting pilots aside, let's talk about drones. Modern drones approved for advanced operations are incredibly efficient and reliable in their construction and control. Their altitude can be controlled with intolerances that aren't even conceivable for manned aircraft. They use state-of-the-art technologies to manage potential emergencies that include safety features and fail-safe systems that have the inbuilt reliability of solid-state integrated circuitry. Onboard systems monitor and record the performance of every component. This results in a speed and accuracy of response to anomalies that no human could ever match. In the event that a drone loses the command link controlling it, something that Nav Canada often suggests is a concern, it will respond with a pre-programmed action that results in it either hovering in place, landing or returning home. Incidences of flyaway drones are incredibly rare and almost invariably result from pilot error. I was unable to find any authoritative documented examples of such an occurrence in Canada within controlled airspace. In fact, so reliable is the current generation of approved drones that in their recent publication of proposals for new drone regulations, Transport Canada made the following remark. Since Part 9 of the Canadian Aviation Regulations governing drones came into force in 2019, the result has been to create a strong safety baseline with no fatalities or serious injuries. Consequently, the Transport Canada proposals include an expansion of privileges granted to advanced certificate holders. So how does all this square up with NAV Canada's approach to drone management? Before June 2021, the company had a regional system for granting approvals by completion of a straightforward performer that was sent to regional offices for consideration. This system was occasionally slow to respond, but offered the ability to communicate with a representative if clarification was required. NAV Canada staff were invariably helpful and responsive. However, in June 2021, Nav Canada introduced an online app that was intended to provide faster, largely automated approvals. Called NavDrone, it was a Canadian adaptation of drone integration technologies developed and marketed by a Belgian company called Unifly. Unifly was formed by pilots, air traffic controllers and engineers. Notably, Drone users are not listed amongst the developers. It's pretty clear that it applied a philosophy of looking down from the perspective of manned aircraft pilots and not up from the point of view of a drone operator. Every aspect of its safety considerations is biased towards protecting traditional aviation requirements, not encouraging or enabling drone flights. This doesn't appear to have been noticed by NAV Canada when they decided to introduce this turnkey foreign solution. Early on, a management decision was taken without consulting the recreational drone community that local air traffic services staff would offer subjective opinions about areas amenable to automated approval within their control zones. 
This immediately compromised what had been a reasonable, logical, software-driven approach by introducing an inescapable human bias. Let's not forget that Canadian aviation regulations require that manned aircraft maintain an altitude of at least 500 feet over the ground, except when landing and taking off, or in a small number of exceptional circumstances. Drones, in the normal course of events, are restricted to a maximum altitude of 400 feet. It's not unreasonable to expect that drones could be automatically authorised to fly up to 400 feet, except in areas aligned with or immediately adjacent to runway lines, or very close to heliports. This is the way that the world's biggest drone manufacturer, DJI, applies its protective geofencing technology, FlySafe, to drone safety management and deconfliction with other aircraft. But the injection of local ATS views into Nav Canada's system created a very different solution that is neither logical nor objective. I'm going to give you some stark examples of this. But first, let me suggest two reasons for the stark differences you'll see in the examples. The first is, I suspect, that the majority of ATS staff have little or no real understanding of how drones work and how reliable their safety systems actually are, leading to a false judgement of any risks involved. The second is almost certainly linked to the first. Many ATS staff have likely fallen prey to alarmist false reporting by the media about the threat drones pose. This is entirely divorced from the evidence provided by objective risk analysis. The flawed arrangements wouldn't necessarily cause problems if a single entity was involved in considering proposals. But NAV Canada management found a way to make a bad situation worse. When manual approval is required, the request, as in the past, goes to a regional centre. But now that centre is required to consult the ATS unit that generated the altitude ceilings that made manual approval necessary. Fold into the mix the fact that regional offices managing our pass requests do not work weekends or evenings, and that only some staff working the control zones are permitted to consider and approve drone flights, the result is that approval is typically delayed up to 48 hours and may take up to seven days, NAV Canada warn. I offered to provide examples of why subjective determination of areas for automated approval is so unsatisfactory. I've looked at several certified airports across the country and they show radically different decisions about areas and altitudes assigned for automated approval. It's important to know before we look at them that NAV Canada applied a system of grid squares to identify different permissions within any control zone. The squares have half nautical mile sides and there are about 368 in a typical five nautical mile zone. The second action was to allocate an altitude ceiling for automatic approval to each grid square. But only five levels were identified and they rise in 100 foot increments from the surface to 400 feet. As we mentioned earlier, the logic of demanding a manual approval for flight along runway lines, the areas immediately adjacent to them, and areas close to heliports is inescapable. And applying it to any takeoff from these areas is perfectly clear. However, elsewhere, since manned aircraft have a minimum altitude to maintain except in exceptional cases, you would expect to see the altitude ceilings increase as they radiated outwards from runways and heliports. This is indeed largely true in many cases, but the human factors touched on earlier, a lack of knowledge of drones and scaremongering, cause some ACS units to apply altitude ceilings that make no sense, and they went unchallenged. For example, when high-rise buildings are in the vicinity, making manned aircraft operation impossible, can an altitude limit of zero be even remotely justified? You probably won't be surprised 
to learn that one of the control zones I looked at is for my own local airport in Kingston, Ontario. A very quiet location with a flight service station supporting a Class E control zone, but no scheduled passenger service and a small number of resident general aviation aircraft and two small flight schools with low activity levels. It has four runways and besides the airport, a water aerodrome is listed, but very rarely if ever used. A relatively busy heliport supporting the regional hospital is present in the downtown area, but it's situated on the lakefront and aircraft generally approach over the water, avoiding the high-rise buildings on every other approach. Given these circumstances, it's a surprise to discover that 20% of the control zone has an altitude ceiling of zero. Equally strangely, there is no grid square assigned a 100 foot ceiling, despite the fact that most of the urban area has high-rise apartment buildings present. Now anyone who hasn't looked elsewhere might be saying at this point, well that doesn't sound too bad. So let's compare it with the more logical and reasonable pattern applied to a major international airport, Ottawa. Here we're looking at a Class C control zone and a very busy airport with multiple runways serving Canada's capital. But it has just 7% of its airspace subject to a zero feet altitude ceiling and 85% is available for drone flight up to 400 feet. Here are another couple of examples of the widely disparate solutions applied under a flawed system of management. Medicine Hat is a regional airport in Alberta, with four runways and a heliport in a Class E control zone. It has many similarities to Kingston, but it's busier. Look at the difference in determination by ATS staff there of automated altitude ceilings. They have identified just 5% of their zone as demanding manual approval for takeoff, and 89% is open to automatic approval to 400 feet. To keep things clean, and to avoid the accusation that I'm taking best and worst case examples, here's one more control zone, the busy airport in Pitt Meadows in BC. This busy airport, close to Vancouver, has six runways and a three nautical mile Class C control zone. Whilst 18% of their airspace demands manual approval for any launch, 51% allows automatic approval to 400 feet and the rest is automatically clear to 200 feet. At this stage, some of you must be wondering, well, why haven't you taken this up directly with Nav Canada instead of producing a video? Well, I did. Back in January, I had a long telephone conversation with the company's RPAS Director of Traffic Management, who had a nav drone engineer sit in. Much of the time was spent trying to persuade me that I was the weak link and that I just needed to use the app more efficiently. The offer was ultimately made to have me submit a list of my concerns and suggestions for improvement of the app for consideration. I did so on more than one occasion and none of them has been actioned. During the conversation, it was frequently argued that we have to maintain safety and avoid collisions at all costs. I suggested that employing an unwieldy app and insisting on users adapting to its quirks was in danger of frustrating drone pilots and could drive them simply to ignore it. The answer was, well, we'll hit them with heavy penalties if they do. This is a weak argument and does nothing to promote safety. It's really ironic that whilst the regulator, Transport Canada, is committed to supporting and assisting the drone community, recognizing the enormous economic potential it has to benefit our country, a badly executed app and poor decision making by Nav Canada is hampering drone use by fielding a poorly supported and badly implemented app whilst hiding behind the excuse of promoting safety. Is Nav Canada failing the drone community? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below and don't be afraid to tell them directly. I'll leave a contact email for them in the video description. Thanks for watching this video and be sure to enjoy your own drone flight 
safely.